Thank you for joining us today on The Deadly Experiment, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with a special program today I thought would be a most interesting program, especially for people of military families, people who have uh, been involved in the United States military over a generation or two of time, uh, and those who are not, because it's most important that you understand from a historical perspective, from God's perspective, what happens to a nation when it is subverted from within. And America was subverted from within in the 20th century, starting at about, well, about 1913 or so. That was the key year when the synagogue of Satan, the sons of Cain, these Cainites that Jesus talks about, they are children of Cain's seed line, the seed line of the serpent. That's right. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Moses said it. Read it for yourself in Genesis 3, verse 16. And the seed line of Cain is recorded in Genesis 4, while the seed line of Adam is in Genesis 5. Now you can understand the subversion that took place within our military and our whole concept of what it constitutes to be or what it should be to be an American. An American is an American by his continental views, by his, uh, if you will, internal views of the promise that was the gift of the founding fathers, we're told. It was one of non-interventionism, non-internationalism, minding one's own business and maintaining a high degree of sovereignty. All of that has gone to which people like Senator Jack Reed and White House would applaud. That's a wonderful thing, that we've lost our sovereignty, that we've lost our compass, our moral compass, that we can be intertwined in the hardships and struggles and warfare of all the nations of the world. To what end? Well, the end is building a one-world beast system that it says is coming right now. Here in the Bible, the Word of God in the book of Revelation, and in Daniel the prophet and Ezekiel, Chapters 37, 38, and 39. Folks, it's happening now. What happened to America? America betrayed her moorings in 1913 when she had the synagogue of Satan give us a Federal Reserve System, a central bank privately owned, an income tax, and then the direct election of senators. Pri pri uh, previous to that, we, we had what we called an appointed Senate uh, seat for two United States senators in each state. They were appointed by their legislature, who was elected by the people. Now it's a direct election, and we have no more control. It was World War I that set the stage for American imperialism and American interventionism. But something mysterious happened after World War II. What was it? Under the Truman administration, we had what was called the reorganization, if you will, for stalemate of our whole War Department. It was changed to the Defense Department. From that point on, we would no longer be winning these so-called wars overseas for freedom. We would be on the losing end and building the one world beast system while helping to destroy America's military and America's stature in the world at the same time. Aren't we there now? We sure are. So I bring you from the 1960s era, old television programs by Dan Smoot, the former FBI agent who was a Harvard educated professor in constitutional law. He had a PhD in English and he was absolutely articulate in all factors of American constitutional government in history. He deals in the first segment that you're about to see now with this reorganization of our military. And then we'll come back to introduce a second segment on the legacy of General Douglas MacArthur. Right now, the first program. Reorganizing for stalemate. Since 1948, there has been a drive to unify American military forces under a single head along the lines of the old German unified command, despite the fact that this cumbersome totalitarian system was a primary reason for Germany's defeat. Unification also ignores lessons of history and the experience of American fighting men. Inter-service competition has been partly responsible for the high morale of Americans in battle, and diversified command has permitted flexibility and individual initiative during times of crisis. The step-by-step -step creation of a monolithic, single-head command structure for our armed forces is pushing us toward military dictatorship, not by experienced military men, but by civilian theorists, 
who are converting the armed forces into a political economic pressure complex to support administration policies. That is a summary of my report on reorganizing for stalemate. The full report after a message from my sponsor. During the heaviest fighting of World War II, General George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, found time to propose a general reorganization of the U.S. military establishment. Marshall wanted centralization of power which would put all services under one Chief of Staff responsible to one Secretary of Defense. Arguments for such a monolithic structure in our armed forces have some theoretical plausibility. Elimination of inter-service rivalry, better coordination of all forces, elimination of duplication and waste. But the theory ignores lessons of history and the combat experience of American fighting men. Inter-service competition has been in large part responsible for the superior morale and esprit de corps which distinguish Americans in combat, which can be, and in many critical times have been, more important than weapons, supplies, or organization. Temporary arrangements for unified battle action by separate and rival branches of American military forces have produced brilliant success, often because the arrangements necessarily left a great deal of leeway for individual initiative on the part of lower echelon commanders. A massive military operation which spreads across thousands of miles and involves millions of men with all types of equipment under a multitude of unpredictable conditions can be choked to death through unification and tight control by one desk man at the top. As to waste and duplication, these are perennial evils of bureaucracy, military and civilian. There seems to be a law of proportion which should counsel us to keep the military and the civilian bureaucracy divided and fragmented into the smallest rival units possible. Waste, duplication, and inefficiency of a governmental unit, agency, or department, military or civilian, seem to multiply in geometric proportions as the size of the unit increases, which means that a governmental unit large enough to have a $2 billion budget is generally about four times as wasteful and inefficient as one large enough to have a $1 billion budget. The George Marshall clique in the Pentagon, which included Eisenhower, pushed hard for the unification plan of having a single chief of staff and a single secretary of defense. But the thin plausibility of their arguments carry enough weight. In 1946, Army historians asked three former chiefs of staff of the German Army to tell what happened on their side during the war and to give their views on the proposed reorganization of our armed forces. The three were Generals Franz Halder, Kurt Zeitzler, and Heinz Guderian. Of the three, Guderian was belligerent and uncooperative. Halder and Zeitzler avoided making recommendations, but did prepare a historical study reflecting opposition to the kind of centralized power being proposed for the American military. Halder and Zeitzler, like a great majority of German generals, felt that the single chief of staff arrangement with tight concentration of power in one man was a primary reason for Germany's defeat. It produced rigidity in times of crisis, prohibiting commanders from altering plans to meet unforeseen developments, holding German forces to a preconceived plan of action which battlefield developments rendered ineffective, even suicidal. These German generals seemed in sympathy with Grand Admiral Karl Gernitz, Hitler's successor as Führer, who rejects the fascist communist ideal of concentrated political power and advocates a governmental system based on old American constitutional principles. The George Marshall clique of political managers who dominated Pentagon planning in the post-war period disliked the ideas of such Germans as Halder, Zeitzler, and Dernitz. They turn to the bellicose Guderian for a recommendation. Guderian is one of very few German generals who advocates the totalitarian state. In 1947, President Truman took an initial major step toward military centralization when, authorized by Congress, he eliminated the old departments of war and navy and created the single Department of Defense. And in 1948, Guderian submitted his plan for reorganizing the American Armed Forces. The Guderian plan would create an all-powerful military dictatorship with the president as its totalitarian head or its tool. 
Guderian would not only establish the old German unified command system, but would also put the military high command in tight control of civilian aviation, civilian transportation, and civilian communications, which means radio, television, press, telegraph, and telephone services. The Guderian plan has become a blueprint for all U.S. military reorganization plans made or attempted since 1948. The total plan, not yet in effect, is being achieved a step at a time. Congress has permitted these dangerous developments by abdicating its own constitutional powers and responsibilities. The Constitution gives to Congress exclusively the responsibility of raising and maintaining armed forces for the United States. Congress, shirking its sworn duty, has passed this constitutional responsibility to the President, who delegates it to egghead intellectuals and who think college degrees are a proper substitute for brains and wisdom, who have no experience in combat and know nothing about the realities of fighting a war. In 1953, President Eisenhower appointed Nelson Rockefeller, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as head of a commission to make a study and proposal for military reorganization. The Rockefeller report recommending more centralization of power became the basis of an Eisenhower reorganization plan which concentrated more power than theretofore in the Secretary of Defense and in the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It seemed a timid step. More propaganda work on the Congress and on the public was needed before bolder measures could be taken without arousing the nation. The Council on Foreign Relations undertook the propaganda job subtly and unobtrusively, of course. J. Robert Oppenheimer, notorious former associate of communist espionage agents and member of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote an article for the July 1953 issue of Foreign Affairs, advocating the emphasis and eventual elimination of nuclear weapons from American armed forces arguing for conventional forces and armaments which might produce stalemate with rather than victory over enemy forces. In 1954, the CFR organized discussion groups to study foreign policy and defense in the nuclear age. All of the emphasis was on preventing American preparation for a nuclear war. Good sense and logic seemed, however, to have more influence on public thought than CFR efforts had. It was obvious that America could not match the communist slave empire in manpower for the kind of conventional forces that Oppenheimer and others urged us to depend on. We could, however, with our superior technology and industrial capacity, outstrip the Soviets in production of nuclear and other new types of weapons. It was obvious that the next war would be fought with the new weapons, that it would be short and violent, and that it would probably be over before massive land armies and other conventional forces and weapons were ever brought into action. International political events also made it obvious that American dependence on foreign bases left us at the mercy of foreign nations, who, even in time of peace when they were on the American dole, often seemed friendlier to the Soviets than to us. Dependence on such nations, or use of bases on their soil, in times of war, when they would be under blackmail threats for the Soviet Union, could be disastrous. A growing public comprehension of such obvious conditions led to a revival of the traditional and sound Fortress America concept of national defense. The concept that we must defend our homeland because we have neither the responsibility nor the capability of defending and policing the world leading military men with combat experience like Admiral Arthur Radford, publicly supported the idea of de-emphasizing foreign bases and foreign military entanglements, arguing for a reduction of spending on conventional forces so that our resources could be devoted to production of such super weapons as missiles and intercontinental supersonic bombers, which would deter enemy aggression by threatening enemy destruction in the event of war. The Council on Foreign Relations intensified its propaganda efforts. In 1957 and 1958, a rash of pretentious books, studies, and reports prepared by CFR members or under CFR auspices hammered the theme that control of our military establishments should be tightly concentrated at the top and that the emphasis in our weapons development, strategy, troop indoctrination, and general policy 
should be on stalemate and compromise rather than victory. The propaganda barrage had enough effect on Congress and the public that Eisenhower in 1958 managed to take one more step toward implementing the Guderian plan, further concentrating power in the Secretary of Defense and in the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, shifting responsibility for military planning away from officers with combat experience, putting it in the hands of desk officers and civilians. With the groundwork prepared, President Kennedy and his Secretary of Defense, McNamara, have taken giant strides toward converting the American Armed Forces into a mammoth political-economic pressure complex controlled by inexperienced civilian intellectuals and theorists to support the administration's political objectives. More on this next week. Goodbye. God bless you. All right, now you can see, folks, from that first report how America's whole military establishment was changed over to the defense establishment, and the progeny thereof has been loss of mainland China to communism, Korea divided, Vietnam, and endless wars of aggression ever since then. Wars that cannot be won because they're not meant to be won. Now, in segment two, we see the legacy of uh, the greatest man of the 20th century in America, General Douglas MacArthur, and what he warned America of in his time before he passed. General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. General MacArthur was the greatest man of the 20th century. An incomparable military genius, he was awarded every medal for bravery under fire that the nation can bestow. He was also a statesman. He symbolized honor, integrity, faith in God, love of country, devotion to duty. He was a discriminating man. Something in him kept him aloof from the pettiness and greed of the faceless crowd. A generation whose political and intellectual leaders teach idolatry of the average man, whose clamor for equality does not mean impartial justice, but enforced leveling of all to dull mediocrity, who have rejected individualism for collectivism, desperately needs a Douglas MacArthur. If other hands do not take up and hold high the flaming torch that MacArthur bore, then his death is an irreparable loss to civilization. That is a summary of my report on General of the Army Douglas MacArthur. The full report after a message from my sponsor. On April 5, 1964, the greatest man of the 20th century went to his rendezvous with God. General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. The old soldier had fought the good fight. His course was run. It was time for him to go. Yet his death is a heavy loss to the world. MacArthur symbolized honor, integrity, faith in God, love of country, devotion to duty. He was a discriminating man. He stood apart from the common herd, not because he was contemptuous of any human being, but because something in him kept him aloof from the pettiness and greed of the faceless crowd. A generation whose political and intellectual leaders teach idolatry of the average man, whose clamor for equality does not mean impartial justice, but enforced leveling of all to dull mediocrity, who have rejected individualism for collectivism, desperately needs a Douglas MacArthur. Was he the last of the breed? There is the question which troubles those who could comprehend his greatness. If other hands do not take up and hold high the flaming torch that MacArthur bore, then his death is an irreparable loss to civilization. For incomparable service to his country as a soldier in three wars, he was awarded every medal for bravery under fire that the nation can bestow, countless non-combat awards from more than 30 nations around the world. In February 1937, General MacArthur warned President Roosevelt that Japan was an aggressive military threat and that the Soviets were involved in Japanese machinations. Roosevelt ignored the warning, but the soldier was right. Operations of Soviet agents in Japan as well as in the United States and other Western nations influenced policies to the end of deflecting Japanese aggression away from Soviet territories toward American, British, and Dutch. A result was our war with Japan. MacArthur was in the Philippines when Japan attacked, December 7, 1941. Three days later, at a time when general confusion and anxiety were at the pitch of hysteria, when America's Pacific fleet was knocked out and the vast Pacific seemed a Japanese lake, MacArthur clearly saw and calmly stated that Japan was recklessly overextended. In scattering her forces southward against the British and Americans, gambling on surprise to bring sudden conquest, Japan had left herself 
defenseless against attack from Soviet bases in the north. The Soviets were dependent on our help in Europe and could not have denied us permission to use their Siberian bases for strikes at Japan, as MacArthur suggested. But again, the great general's advice was ignored in Washington. There is no indication that the Roosevelt administration even asked to use Soviet air bases in Siberia. MacArthur's master stroke would have saved thousands of American lives lost in the savage island-hopping war of the Pacific. But the golden opportunity which he saw and reported three days after Pearl Harbor was not seized. Though Japan struck us, we retaliated against Germany to give maximum help to England and the Soviets in Europe, permitting our Soviet ally to maintain a treaty of peace with Japan throughout the war. In comparison with the manpower and material we poured into the European theater, MacArthur was on short rations in the Pacific. Yet it was in the Pacific, thanks to MacArthur's genius, where the most brilliant maneuvers were conceived and executed. Never enjoying full support from Washington, MacArthur waged a war in the Pacific which will be a classic example of military excellence until the last syllable of recorded time. After his message of December 10, 1941, urging that the Soviets be brought into the war against Japan, MacArthur dropped the subject. By the end of summer 1944, he realized that Japan, already whipped without Soviet help, should be permitted to surrender before the Soviets could enter. Dismissing MacArthur as our greatest general but poorest politician, Roosevelt went to Yalta and made deals which brought Stalin into a war we had already won. Immediate consequences were the shattered or lost lives of thousands who fell in the Pacific between February and August 1945 and the needless atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Longer range consequences of delaying Japanese surrender until the Soviets were at leisure to enter a war they would not help fight were the Soviet rape of Manchuria, the communist conquest of China, and the war in Korea. In Korea, MacArthur's greatness as a general astonished the world. In brilliance and daring, the Incheon landing, which MacArthur conceived and successfully executed, has no parallel in the history of warfare. In Korea, 54,246 Americans died in vain because Truman rejected MacArthur's advice, shackled his efforts, and dismissed him from command. Longer-range consequences were the disasters in French Indochina, in Laos, in South Vietnam. After Korea, General MacArthur sounded a call to arms for all Americans to restore the crumbling foundations of their republic. Here are excerpts from one of the last major speeches the General made. Quote, Taxes have grown so rapidly in recent years that now they are the largest single item in the cost of living. Americans will pay for government this year more than they will spend on food, clothing, medical care, and religious activities combined. Whether we want it or not, we pay now for almost unlimited government, a government which limits our lives by dictating how we are fed and clothed and housed, how to provide for old age, how the national income, which is the product of our labor, shall be divided among us, how we shall buy and sell, how long and how hard and under what circumstances we shall work. Our national indebtedness is now greater than the combined debt of all other nations on earth, and now our government this year proposes to spend as much as all other governments put together. Our swollen budgets are misrepresented to the public. Our government has kept us in a perpetual state of fear with the cry of grave national emergency. Always there has been some terrible evil at home or some monstrous foreign power that was going to gobble us up if we did not blindly rally behind government and furnish the exorbitant funds demanded. Yet, in retrospect, these dangers seem never to have been real. They never seem to have happened. Another of the great illusions is that government gives the people free much of what they get from its services. The painful truth is this. The government produces nothing of itself. Whatever it spends for people, it must previously take from the people in the form of taxes. Moreover, whenever the government gives a service to the people, it must at the same time take away from the people the right to provide and decide for themselves. And the amount which government doles back to the people or spends to 
promote their welfare is always only a fraction of what government has taken away from them because of the excessive costs of governmental administration. It is the little people, so-called, that pay the largest part of the bill. Eighty-five percent of all the billions of dollars paid in income taxes comes from the lowest tax brackets. The contest for ages has been to rescue liberty from governmental power. The great patriots of the American Revolution revolted not so much against the actual taxes imposed upon them by a British king as against the concept of government behind the taxes. The concept that government had unlimited power to do what government thought proper. They had a deep suspicion that government, if permitted, would waste the labors of the people and ultimately curtail the power of the people, always under the pretense of taking care of the people. That is why they tried to bind the government down with a constitution, limiting the government's powers to the performance of carefully specified responsibilities. There are many who have lost faith in this early American ideal and believe in a form of socialistic totalitarian rule, a sort of big brother deity government to run our lives for us. They no longer believe that free men can manage their own affairs. Their central thesis is to take your money away from you on the presumption that a handful of men in government can spend the proceeds of your toil and labor to greater advantage than you who earn the money. Nowhere in the history of the human race is there justification for this reckless faith in political power. It is the oldest, most reactionary of all forms of social organization. It was tried out in ancient Babylon, ancient Greece, and ancient Rome, and Mussolini's Italy and Hitler, Germany, and in all communist countries. Whenever and wherever it has been attempted, it has failed utterly to provide economic security and has generally ended in national disaster. It embraces an essential idiocy that individuals who as private citizens are not able to manage the disposition of their own earnings become in public office supermen who can manage the affairs of the world. The old American philosophy of government more effectively promoted the ideal of human freedom with greater material abundance for more people than any governmentally planned system ever propounded. The fundamental and ultimate issue, however, is not merely our money. It is liberty itself. Excessive taxation of an overgrown government versus personal freedom, a least common denominator of mediocrity against the proven progress of pioneering individualism, the robot or the free man." End quote. That was a passage from one of the last major speeches of General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. May God rest his soul. Goodbye. God bless you. Well, folks, by these two intelligent, articulate, incredibly accurate segments of American history within the defense establishment, i.e. the so-called War Department, the Pentagon today, you can see the handwriting on the wall. Uh, we have lost that legacy that General MacArthur told us about. We have not had victory over communism, quite the contrary. We had a betrayal to communism out of World War II and its progeny. Endless wars, endless enemies, endless conflicts, and endless war for peace. Folks, can you see now the handwriting on the wall? And who brought us here but the sons of Cain in your Bible? Genesis 3, 16, Jesus identified them in the Gospel of John. Chapter 8, verse 44. And ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. We're out of time. We hope to see you on the next program, God willing. Until then, for the Deadly Experiment, Rick Adams, God bless you, and Yahweh bless his elect. <laughs>